Thank you very much to the organisers for giving us this platform. I'm just here to facilitate, but uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers here um, who cover actually a nice diverse range of the, of the cell therapy industry. We've got uh, Lucia, who, who uh, comes from the angle of having been there right at the beginning in terms of developing the early stage technologies, which um, you know, some of which have been picked up by GSK. We've got Michael, who brings the uh, large farmer um, perspective and also the academic perspective. We've got Alec, who, as we heard earlier on, is, is bringing the perspective of a company that's, that's reaching reimbursement. And we've got David, who's, who's there, uh, and uh, again, a veteran of the industry, but also bringing uh, the perspective of tools and technologies and, and, and how the technology can develop. Um, the cell therapy catapult, people are pretty familiar with our role in, in cell therapy, but uh, perhaps less so with gene therapy. We started deliberately with with cell therapy, but our scope does include um, all ATMPs, and, and we've gradually expanded out into, into cell therapy. Um, as a panel, we are um, conscious of the fact that you've already had two commercialization panels today, so we're going to try and stay very closely <coughs> onto, the, onto the gene therapy aspect of what we're doing, although we may diverge a couple of times onto uh, some of the more fruitier subjects, perhaps uh, reimbursement a little bit later on. So in terms of the format of what we're going to do, I'm going to ask each, one, each of the um, speakers to introduce themselves and also the company that they work for and the activities that, that, that they do. Um, and then we'll move into a, a series of themed questions, if you like. Uh, so let's start with Sam Michael. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for having me. So I um, have a chair in virology at King's College London. Uh, I've worked on adeno-associative virus biology for longer than I care, care to think about. And, uh, a, about a year ago, Pfizer has asked me uh, to join them on a secondment from King, King's College London to establish and run their Genetic Medicines Institute, which is designed to, to develop the, necessity, the necessary um, items to enable Pfizer to, to engage in, G, in gene therapy. And in, contra in contrast to the program, I have now nothing to do with UCL anymore. That's a post that I've given up a couple of months ago. Um, hello again, uh, Alec Orfanidis, uh, so I'm with Unicare, I've been with Unicare about uh, two years now, and uh, I've been uh, about, gosh, 28 some years in the industry. Um, I've worked in big pharma, I've worked in medium pharma, I've worked in biotech, and, uh, and now the, the gene therapy challenge. Hello, uh, my name is, uh, I really appreciate it to be here today, and I'm uh, the Director of Business Development of uh, Fondazione Teleton which is an Italian charity um, uh, fundraising every year from public donation uh, and uh, sponsoring and supporting research on uh, genetic diseases. Um, Fondazione Teleton was created in the 90s uh, out of the will of the patient association. At the time it was uh, focused on muscular dystrophy and then we opened up to other <coughs> genetic diseases. And in these 25 years past, we have been uh, experiencing at a small level what uh, a normal pharma and biotech company is experiencing. So we started from supporting very basic research. Um, and uh, we, are now, uh, we have now been able to bring this research uh, specifically on uh, different uh, gene therapy approaches uh, with the lentiviral platforms or with the AAB platforms. Uh, to the clinics. And uh, today it's nice uh, to be here because, uh, you know, this path that uh, we have taken uh, is something in which uh, we have always uh, been thinking of uh, the real final mission. Of Fondazione Teleton, which is uh, to bring the therapy to the patients and to make it available to the patients. So, I'm coming back to a comment that was made this morning. Uh, for us, it's not enough to have uh, a very high quality uh, science or nature or uh, paper, but it's important to make sure that whatever we have funded and that is really translatable to become a cure and a treatment for the patients is available to patients all over the world. And we have done this with partnership with uh, industrial companies. We'll come back to that. 
Hi, so um, I've been playing with viruses, I guess, for getting on for the last 25 years. I uh, have um, taken a couple of viral vaccines to development and, and to market launch and uh, have uh, been involved in taking gene therapy viral um, products through into the clinic. I've uh, set up and sold a couple of um, viral uh, CMO businesses. And in this iteration of my career, I've now taken a slightly tangential approach to the industry and I'm now working in a, a synthetic biology tools company. And our whole approach now is incredibly novel. It's to actually custom design uh, promoters using synthetic design engineering principles. And so you say, well, why is that so interesting? What, what's so exciting about a promoter? Well, if you think about everything in, in, in biology, it's driven from genes. Genes are driven by promoters. And so whilst um, a lot of uh, you guys are developing some incredibly exciting, novel, scientific artistry, almost, uh, I, humor me with an analogy, you're almost coming up with the, uh, the James Bond, Aston Martin in terms of gadgetry and what you're capable of doing. The reality is that when you think of the promoter, you're driving that great machine with something that's equivalent to the steam engine in terms of being resource heavy, large and cumbersome, uncontrollable, and uh, environmentally damaging. And so the approach we're taking is to say, well, it's about time that we applied some rational design and engineering principles to create novel promoters in which you can custom design specificity. So specificity of, of tissue or cell type, or so they're only active <coughs> in certain cells, they're only active in certain <coughs> biological environments or they're only active in terms of um, um, specific inducers. And so um, uh, Nick was kind enough to, um, uh, Alex, sorry, kind enough to, to mention Sympromix and some of the, the collaboration we're doing with, with Unicure. So here, some of the challenges, how do we create a promoter that's small enough to increase the packaging capacity of AAB and still make it tissue specific and still make it regulatable in terms of the strength of, of its level of, of expression. And so a particular example there is we've been able to create something that's less than 250 base pairs, is only active in a, in a liver cell, and has expression levels that basically can be tuned in to be anything up to five to tenfold higher than CMV, or equally you can select the expression level that's appropriate to your product of interest. Thank you. Right. So the um, first thing I'd like to do is, is actually try and uh, get the panel to, to frame the industry in terms of what are we actually talking about and where is that industry. If, uh, you know, if I remember back to my school days, gene therapy was the big thing then. So um, where are we now with the industry and uh, what's different? I think yeah, in a way we're in a perfect storm right now when it comes to, when it comes to gene therapy. The most important component of which has been academic work that has been ongoing for a couple of decades in the field and now we're ready to start harvesting some of the fruit in, in the form of positive clinical data in, in, in humans. Now this is paired really with, with a development which is maybe more in the industry, which is now recognizing that rare diseases where gene therapy currently takes place in is, is really something that even very large companies should start taking seriously in sense of thinking about, thinking about engaging in, in, in rare diseases. Together with that, of course, we have, we have two developments, interest in rare diseases and, and, and second of all, a promise and initial show of, of feasibility of disease modifying approaches in this space. And, and, and of course, this is then paired with a significant amount of investment and, and together is, is now our challenge to try to take these, in my view, these things together and, and, and move them forward out of the academic space, which we really have to admit this is where the knowledge sits and where everything has been developed out or in partnership with the ad academic field into, into a place where we can take medicine out. And I think that's where the journey now starts, which is, you know, what are the things we have to do? The proof of concept is here, but now what do we have to do to make it into a medicine? And I think there's a lot of interesting and fun work to be done in that, in that area. 
Alec, do you agree with that? Is that why the industry is still in? Uh, still I th- I, well, I heard, we heard this morning page one, chapter one, so I'd like to be a little more optimistic, and I think we, or chapter, or page three, I think somebody else said, right? It probably is page one, two, or three of chapter one, but I'd like to think that it's volume two. Yeah? <laughs> so hopefully volume one was the last 40 years when we were, you know, from the inception of gene therapy all the way up until um, we've actually, now we have a approved product in the West, and we have a commercially prescribed product in the West, and um, I think we're learning a lot from, from Glybera, from uh, not only the regulatory process, but certainly the reimbursement process, and this will only help us as we go forward in subsequent pages and chapters, but hopefully again, of volume two. Anything to add from you guys? Um, I mean, from my perspective, having sort of seen this from the, from the early 90s, uh, then there was obviously that first wave of enthusiasm. It was incredibly exciting. There were some early indications of, of clinical efficacy, but then there were, there were some major issues as well. And so the focus on, in those days, adenovirus and the immune response and the, um, some of the issues around that were, were very difficult. Some of the early SCID data obviously had, had its difficulties and challenges, and then obviously with the, uh, with the uh, fatality in, in the clinical trial as well. And so we, really the cold, chill wind blew the, through the industry and drove out a lot of that initial flush of enthusiasm. But thankfully for the industry, the academics went back to the lab and started to unravel and analyze and work out what had happened and how can we do better? Because there was still the basic understanding that if you can, if you can cure a genetic disease by delivering the gene, you're onto something. And I think the fact that the academic community kept faith, worked out some of the issues, the, the AAV that Michael is much better to talk about than I, but the work that's gone on in, in that area, I think now has, has um, it brought a body of good, strong, underpinning science and understanding and now emerging data around it. So I think it is a much those your more robust picture now. Richard? Than yeah, I perfectly agree with you. I think that uh, a lot of work has been done by academics uh, in, <coughs> in improving the vector design, in uh, uh, characterizing the patient population. Uh, one important thing is that uh, our experience uh, is on monogenic diseases, which are the perfect, as we were uh, as, uh, hearing this morning, you know, the perfect scenario in which. Uh, try and to prove the efficacy and the safety of, uh, of gene therapy. Understanding very well uh, the patient population, uh, understanding uh, the re- uh, enrollment criteria as uh, the endpoints uh, to characterize and uh, set up a clinical trial that will have the best chances to prove the efficacy is the way we have come, uh, uh, we have come through. And uh, a very important thing is also uh, doing all this work with in mind the fact that you need to bring them that result to the market and uh, make it uh, uh, acceptable also for regulatory authorities and uh, usable to, uh, for any patient. So we have done a lot of this work um, in our experience. You know, we started uh, with uh, the ADA SCID uh, um, gene therapy approach. We treated 12 patients and uh, uh, amazingly, they are all doing well. Then there was a lot of work that we had to do to put together a dossier that was convincing for regulatory authorities so that the GSK helped us in this partnership to bring the product to the market and is now under evaluation. <coughs> and uh, what we felt, it was that uh, we had uh, the need to really talk a lot and to interact a lot with regulatory authorities. Uh, they were open for that. Uh, they still didn't have the culture experience, uh, the knowledge of what we were talking about. It was a new paradigm. So from that point of view, it was really <laughs> chapter one, page one, you know, starting all over from scratch. And I'm sure Alec had uh, the same experience uh, in, uh, in Unicure. But that was a needed step. What is happening now is that we are getting uh, very good results uh, so far from clinical trials. Uh, we are getting therapies that are one-shot therapies. Uh, in most cases. So again, they are changing uh, all the perspective and the scenarios of uh, uh, treatments of, uh, of patients. And we have uh, other innovation that is coming from academia that will, will foster and will uh, 
um, uh, bring in uh, into the pipeline that pharmaceutical companies have been, you know, starting using in, in the past five years. So I think that the process is still ongoing, you know, it's still something in which academic will fuel, you know, the pipeline and uh, will have then uh, pharma and biotech companies to complete the pathway to arrive to the patient. So picking up on that a bit in terms of, um, you know, this, this transition from academia to commercialization and, and you've been through that process and to some extent you're sitting on both sides of it. Um, and working with the regulatory environment and, and, and is, it, is it a favorable environment? Is it, as we heard earlier on, an environment where actually, you know, if you've got the data and you follow the rules that you know where you stand, you can get on? Is it a positive environment for, for the development of, of well, gene I, therapies? Well, I, I think it is. So the only, th what we are facing as again academics uh, that are developing innovation is the fact that, uh, you know, we have been setting the quality standards uh, and uh, we are moving uh, toward quality standards that apply to products that reach the market. Still, if you are in academia and you want to create innovation and you want to bring it to a proof of concept, that will make sense then for further investments. You cannot uh, be able to apply exactly the same restricted standards that are up <coughs> applied at the moment to products that get to the market. So this is something that in the academic community is very much felt and is such that even the EMA has been going through a consultation document in which they are even interrogating, you know, the academics, the companies themselves, whether we should uh, decline a different paradigm, whether you are talking about a product that is entering the clinical stage and the product that then is brought to the market. Uh, it's a very difficult balance to make. Uh, is, I mean, is, is it, I mean, perhaps Michael, you might want to add on to this. I mean, we're not talking about different reg regime, we're talking about different stages in the process, aren't we? Yeah. But still, there are also uh, outcomes in terms of uh, um, quality should, uh, should be secured in all the different stages. Uh, but there are certain kind of uh, assays uh, and evaluations of the products uh, that require certain kind of standards when you get to the, to the market. Uh, and they're different one when you are still uh, evaluating it in phase one. Well, you're on both sides of this. So. so <laughs> You know, my experience with the regulators were, uh, when we've had discussions were also, was always very positive. And in, in, a, in a sense, framed by, I think, the sheer fact that it is a learning experience for both sides, if there are two sides to it. Actually, I it come more to understand that there's one side with two aspects that are working together towards, um, a, to, to, towards a particular goal. So, I, we found the regulators always very, very responsive um, to, to the fact that we need to co-evolve, um, to, to, to co-evolve this. Where I think it needs work, and I think you picked this up uh, to a certain extent, is that of course the industry has very different views. For the industry, it's also novel technology. Mm -hmm. And you have drug development paradigms that you usually follow, and maybe these drug development paradigms are not always exactly the same in gene therapy. We can't do a phase one trial with AAV gene therapy. We have to have a first in patient trial. So how, how do you deal that in a normal pipeline of, of, of yeah. drug development? And I think the third partner of this lear learning experience, meaning academics, regulators, the third partner in this is the industry, which now recognizes that, well, actually, we have to adjust our thinking around, around this as well. And, and maybe, maybe take this in a positive sense because you know, the, the drive is always there to, to speed up drug development mm -hmm. to a certain extent, and the, the drug development paradigm in gene therapy is so different, and in many cases quicker than a traditional um, drug development paradigm that maybe in the, in the era of rare diseases we can start, we can start also leading a, a, a little bit of re, a re, reinvention of some of, some of the aspects of getting, getting a drug into commercialization. I think, I think there are three parties to this, all of which have to learn, and, and, and in my view, or at least from where I sit, all three parties seem, seem very positive. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, certainly my, from my experience with the regulators, it's been very positive. I think there's a matter of perspective um, here. When you, and, and in my view, there's, a, there's, if you like, the 
the point of regulatory crisis or challenge, which is the point at which you transition from phase two into a pivotal phase three, or as we as discussed earlier, if you're trying to define your phase two is if you get the right output, your pivotal data. And that's where the, the mindset fundamentally changes and the perspective and the regulator's perspective changes. So from what I've seen, the regulators um, will, will almost fall over back, backwards to try and help an innovative product get into a phase one, phase two study. Uh, and uh, provided issues around safety are being, being addressed and controls are being addressed, they will do whatever they can to help get you there. But then when you start to talk about Pivotal, you, your mindset is then, it, in my view, is what does this product look, need to look like as a licensed product to meet a BLA submission and that, that regulatory requirement. And there you start to then have challenges around, well, how do you define your dose? How do you develop your bioassay? And how do you demonstrate efficacy? And how do you make sure you've then got the rigor that's going to be required of a reproducible, robust process delivering a safe, efficacious, controllable product? And that, that gap analysis, if you like, is something to take to a regulatory authority and have a discussion with and engage early over to ease that route then to market. And I think, um, but again, from, from my experience, they're always positive and helpful conversations. So there's a bonus question inherent in that, which I'll come back to later if we have time, which relates to something that Michael said as well in terms of, you know, when you've got ever decreasing population, how you actually make the system work economically to, to deliver all of that data. But um, I keep things moving a little bit, try and touch on another theme, which is, um, you know, we talked a bit about rare diseases and rare diseases in, in certain applications. You, know, you need a relatively small amount of the product. Um, but in theory, you know, gene therapy is not just for rare diseases. It may be the starting point for all of that. But are we ready? And could we even do a, a, a non-rare disease in the current state? David, you'll talk a little bit about what's available in terms of, of technologies to manufacture. Technologies and manufacturing capacity. Throughout my career, I've lived a roller coaster when it comes to uh, manufacture for, for gene therapy products. In, in the, in, in the, uh, the mid-90s, I was, I was running a, a viral vector CMO business, uh, was planning a big expansion and investment in that, had money lined up, and then, as I said, the chill wind uh, drove that market away, and, and it went away, and then about uh, three years ago, I was walking the streets of London with another model looking for investment into a, a, a viral vector um, gene therapy CMO business. And whilst I could see the tsunami of opportunity coming, the investor community just wasn't ready for it. So again, that, that went away. So you now look and say, well, what's the situation? Um, two years ago, then, uh, it started to change, and now it's even even more urgent. And so there's this issue of just capacity. Is it is it there? And and it quite clearly isn't. Um, I think newly funded gene therapy companies are now developing pipelines. There's more phase one, phase two products coming through down the pipe, and and the capacity that had been established by academic groups um, in in these niche GMP facilities, they're now stacked out. And there is not yet a good, robust CMO business picking up the spare capacity. And then you think about the, the rigor or the, the, not just the scale, but the, the quality standard required to, to get something ready to go into phase three in commercial supply. And is that capacity available? And again, there, there is a, a real lack uh, in that sense. So just in terms of manufacturing capability, let alone the technologies you use to make it, then there's, I would say there's a, so there's, there's a statement of the problem. Are there any solutions coming up? Anybody? Michael? Well, yeah, to, to the first point about the rare diseases, really, I think you have a particular opinion about that. I mean, first, first of all, I think a lot of the what we call common diseases in the future will be treated more like rare diseases because of the genomic, the, uh, the genomic <coughs> revolution. So cancer, we can start subdividing patients because we understand it better. In, in neurodegenerative diseases, potentially, we'll have the same, <clears throat> so the same, the same learning process where all of a sudden we recognize a very broad common disease. It's actually not a common disease, but a very well de genetically defined rare disease, just <coughs> multiplied many times over. <clears throat> the, 
so dealing in the rare disease space is maybe not a bad not a bad thing even for the more common diseases in particular for AV gene therapy I think <clears throat> when we go into genetically less defined um, areas what we have to deal with is we have to address a hypothesis a disease hypothesis well what if we engage in this pathway do we get a clinical benefit or not we now pair that with a viral <clears throat> vector of which we have limited information in human tissue, and all of a sudden we have a scenario of two different, um, uh, two unknowns really, and, and that just means we have to do larger clinical trials. In the, in you know, monogenic, well-defined diseases, we can take a test vector. We know what what the disease hypothesis is. We don't need to check that. We know if we give that gene, we will successfully, we will cure the disease. So we can now test the vector. And once we accumulate these kind of uh, these these type of data, so we we will we will um, sort of make a constant out of the vector variable. But in in that view, I think that gene therapy will go through the rare disease space more extensively to in, in more different in, in different in different tissues first to get to really de-risk the process to a certain extent, and then and then of course the the common diseases where, where we need to address disease pathways in the clinical trial will become amenable to, to, to therapy. Okay. So. okay. But, but even if you do that, all right, so let's say you focus on the rare diseases. If everybody goes into rare diseases and you've got thousands of rare diseases, you've still got a problem. You've still got a capacity problem, presumably. How, how is that going to be dealt with? Or is it being dealt with? I think the capacity problem is being dealt with. Um, it, I don't think it's solved by, by no means. Um, some might disagree here in, the, in, the, in this panel. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I, I think the capacity problem is certainly not solved for, 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 uh, for many different reasons. One of them is quality control. We actually don't quite know how to measure these viruses. We can measure DNA, we can measure capsid, but we can't really, on a purified virus, measure bioactivity, <clears throat> which is really the defining part of a viral vector. So we kind of need to need, need to learn that in order to to really solve the capacity problem first. So so I think there are many many questions to be addressed, but there are different ways, different strategies that in the AAV space we 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 get towards towards a scale that is now doable. Let's say up to the phase three trial. Not really the product yet, but give us time, and, and I think this, this this will be solved. In all different ways. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> and and I think it depends on the on the type of um, of AV, the type of production system that you're using. Um, I think what you were talking about earlier maybe would be volume three, right? So right now we're still in volume two, um, and or one for some. Yeah, <laughs> well, we hope we're at volume two. Um, Unicure has been criticized in the past, and I think it uh, hurt our uh, our stock at, at some points in, in our life. Uh, the fact that we invested heavily into this uh, large manufacturing uh, facility and people were saying, you know, why are you doing this? Uh, you don't need to do this now. It's uh, a cash drain and in fact it, it didn't help our, uh, our, our burn rate. Um, but we're at a point now where we should be getting validation of our site in the next couple of weeks. And if you, if you look at, you know, going from, from 50, uh, 2 times 50 in Amsterdam and now we're at uh, 2 times 500 and we have the capacity to go to uh, two, 2 times 2,000, and even when we look at the programs that we are engaged in with BMS, and we look at the potential number of patients that we'll be treating uh, going forward, um, we believe that we are able to do that. Now, I agree with you with the quality question, but it's, it's, it's a step towards scale-up, yeah? but the scale-up part, I think we've got it solved, and we'll still have to pay a particular attention to quality and ensure that that stays as we, as we scale-up, but the scale-up part itself with the technology that we're using, I think we've got it covered. Okay. Yeah, no, I, th I think I agree in, in terms of the backload system, Unicure have a scalable solution. I think out outside of that s system, then there is, there is a need for scalable alternative right. solutions, and they don't exist. And so the fact that the, the industry is still reliant on triple transfection of an anchorage-dependent cell that's limited by um, by surface area and lots of manual manipulations is one issue. The fact that 90% of the vector you produce is probably empty uh, and differentiating um, from a full vector from an empty vector is incredibly challenging and people are using decades old 
technology around um, ultra centrifugation to do that. And these, these are huge limitations in, in terms of scalable, some novel solutions that are required to come up with a, a more advanced manufacturing platform. We've, our our uh, promoter technology is going to be one solution on the upstream side, uh, but the downstream side has, has still got a lot of work, work to do. But so in, in terms of whether the issues will get addressed, I, so I, I think they will, simply because what I'm seeing now is investors are actually tuned in to the criticality of, of manufacture and capacity and, and supply, uh, and so are asking all the right questions of the companies as part of the due diligence, so I think that's a, that's a great step. I think, though, um, we were just talking earlier that back in the early 90s, the monoclonal antibody world published hugely on capacity crunch for, for monoclonal antibody production. And there's some really good analysis done forecasting out literage required and size of bioreactors required. And so people like Lonzo or Celtech at, at, at the time, and BI and DSM, various other people invested heavily in stainless steel in the ground to serve that market. I think. What we still don't have from a, a vector, viral vector perspective is that type of analysis that's being done. We know there's a huge, a huge issue. We know there's a huge capacity crunch today and an ever-increasing one in the future. But the hard sort of economic analysis, market analysis that underpinned the investment in monoclonals, I don't think has yet been done in this space, and if there's one thing we could really do with, I think it is that sort of an analysis. So, so that brings me on to a related question, if you like. Uh, you know, if what we're saying is there's, there's a, a, a lot of investment needed, and actually, from what I see, a lot of investment heading towards production technologies for, for um, viral vectors. Um, and I'm sort of mindful of an analogy from my own experience, again, back in my childhood, where GM, uh, GSM phones came in. And when they came in with a standard that everybody pre appreciated, the technologies that were used to manufacture the phones and, and actually the systems themselves plummeted in price. And that's why the whole industry just went wild. Is there an opportunity? Have we, is it timely? And is there a practical opportunity within this industry to, to do something analogous in terms of standards so that everybody's operating in a way that, that they can combine the research effort, if you like? Or is, it, is that just going to erode everybody's uh, intellectual property? Yeah, so, you know, this is very dear to my heart. I think uh, it's essential that we set this up because in, uh, in the space, maybe a little less so in the lentiviral space, but in the AAV space, standards are <clears throat> basically not existing. So there are all these different serotypes of AAV out there that transduce cells at different rates. They're, you know, more active on one cell versus the other and vice versa. And um, what you see if two people I manufacture the identical virus, the identical recombinant virus, and you test them against each other, and they come from two different <coughs> labs, they, they behave more differently than two, two different serotypes behave on, on, on a test cell. So uh, the, the, the issue of, of standardization is huge, because at the end of the day, we, we rely on publications, of which there are many out there, that, that predict the behavior of, of, of a certain certain combination in, 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 in vivo. And, and in order to really be able to rely on these type of data, what we have to do, we have to agree on standards. And, and for that, we have to start thinking about the biology again of the virus. So what do we actually want to standardize? You know, the normal stuff is, you know, the contaminants, that's easy. But then the comp these are complex biological entities, these viruses, which, which can or can, can be more or less infectious and, and, and therefore more active. And what we need is a bit more of an understanding of what are the contributions of manufacturing onto any of these components. So I think standards yeah. are absolutely crucial. And uh, from a, I totally agree with what Michael said, but then looking at it from a different perspective, then um, the, the cost of goods impact of, of analytics uh, then for a vial product, over half of the cost of, that, of getting that product in, made and into a vial is QC cost. And the proportion of a batch, particularly when you're in the orphan drug um, area where your batch size is small, the proportion of a batch you sacrifice to testing could be 50% as well. And the biggest reason for, for batch failure is an out of spec analytical result. And so you've got layer and layer just around the analytics that we need to think through of how to make them, make them precise, make them robust, make them re reproducible, 
um, to address a cost of goods issue. So, Alec, the, the, just I'm picking on you because you've got a product in the market. The, the cell therapy wisdom is, you know, and we heard it, you know, the, you know, the process is the product, um, which I hasten to add, I think cell therapy caspot, we're hoping that the process stops being the product and the product itself is identifiable. But um, for, for you, if there was sort of, uh, is there IP, is, is your advantage in your manufacturing process or is it... We, be elsewhere? we believe it is because that is exactly what's allowing us to, to meet the scale-up needs. Right. Uh, by the way, the product is the process is something we were saying uh, as well for the last two years and I heard uh, earlier someone said oh, it's been trotted out a lot. It has been trotted out a lot, including by us, but I think that we need to get beyond that and, and you know, as, we, as we evolve into, into volume two. Um, but yes, I think that um, you know, the, the capabilities, um, we are poised to meet the needs. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, certainly from our perspective, we see, a, a, we see the need being quite clearly identified in terms of the, the gene therapy industry, but a lot of attention being paid to it and a lot of um, you know, corporate investment going into it. So uh, I hope that those problems will get solved. I'd like to move on to a, a slightly different subject now. Um, and that's, this is the uh, sort of the hot topic that, that popped up earlier on in the day, but I'm just surprised it didn't get uh, a fuller airing. And that's the question of uh, the crossing line, if you like, crossing the finishing line. And, uh, and getting paid. And uh, you know, we've got these single application technologies uh, which produce enormous amounts of value and potentially high prices. So um, Alec, do you want to give us a little bit of a, a sense of, of what it takes to, to get paid for a million euro product? Well, I'm still trying to figure out, I think together with our friend Chiesi, uh, what it does take to get paid. Um, it's, um, it, it's a learning process. It's a challenge. and. Um, it's where we see um, a lot of fragmentation. And we're talking a lot about regulatory process and our, how are the regulators, are they, you know, and, and I think what we've concluded this morning and today also, or sorry, this afternoon, is that the regulators themselves um, are very open. They're willing to talk and dialogue and, and they're looking for ways to accelerate. Uh, if you look at the programs that EMA uh, has, and we talked about adaptive pathways or adaptive licensing, um, I heard the word prime mentioned. There's a document uh, for consultation now. Uh, it's a new initiative called Priority Medicines. So from the regulatory point of view, I think this is fine. And then huh, the problems start when you try and get reimbursement. And I think our, our great European experiment uh, is doing okay from a regulatory point of view, right? You have a single approval and you get 28 countries. That's great. And then you go and negotiate and you deal with individual reimbursement authorities and um, not to name names, but in some cases you get people who will tell you that we don't believe that the product uh, does what it's supposed to do. And you think, well, hang on a sec, you know, EMA has approved this, and, and here's the data, and here's what it does. Uh, you see, but we're not going to pay for it. Well, hang on a sec, you can pay less for it. We can argue and discuss on the amount, the value that you see. We can argue on and, and discuss and agree on the, um, the payment methods, schemes, um, and there are a number of ways we can do, well, the easiest, of course, is one-off, but then you have to have fantastic data, and you have to basically, you know, the patient gets off the deathbed, and there you go, you know, that's easy to pay for. But in, in the early days of gene therapy, it's much more difficult to have an overnight cure, correct? We're, we're making baby steps progress, and we will get there eventually. But so now, when you come and you say, we have, you know, 5.8 years, as you heard from Diego this morning, uh, of, um, of efficacy, and yes, it may seem like the initial price you know, could be a high sticker shock number, but you divide that by the number of years, and it's actually a lot less than enzyme replacement therapies, et cetera. And that argument will sometimes fall on, on deaf ears. And so then what we'd like to do is discuss with the authorities ways that we could, you know, different pricing schemes, payment schemes. Uh, can we uh, do annuities? Can we pay for performance? Can we keep paying as long as uh, it works and there's, a, and there's a response? And this becomes relatively easy with some types of products. If you talk about hemophilia B, where you have factor IX expression that you can actually track very easily, and as long as the factor IX expression is above X, then you can uh, pay, keep paying every year, fine. But for Glybera, there is no way to measure. And uh, Glybera has the added complication that if a patient goes out and does something silly, like eating a very high-fat meal, you may find yourself uh, in the hospital with pancreatitis that is not at all due to the drug not being efficacious. And so there are a whole host of, of problems, challenges,
diversity in countries, and I think this, this is the one that we're going to have to really get our uh, heads around. You know, if, you, if you look at the number of clinical studies ongoing, Unicure took a, a, a quick look. Ten years ago, there were seven uh, on clinicaltrials.gov. I think there are about 165 later stage um, trials now. So these are going to be submitted uh, very shortly, and uh, you know, the regulators are happy to approve them, and then throw it over the fence to the reimbursers who are going to go, you know, what do we do with this? So I think we need a lot of dialogue. I think, you know, we talk a lot about um, adaptive licensing, adaptive pathways. I think we need to talk with them about adaptive reimbursement. And in rare diseases, um, when you just do not have the number of patients to show convincing uh, HDA pharmacoeconomic data, um, and, and I see their point, you know, why would they pay? Well, we know it works and we know it does this. I think we need some kind of an adaptive, iterative process to say, look, let's discuss and let's agree on this kind of a pricing model, and we will take the responsibility to come back and see you as we get more data to confirm what we have decided or not. And, and that, to me, is, is an adaptive way of approaching reimbursement. So but we mean, have a lot of progress to make. Certainly from my perspective, um, those conversations are going on at the moment with, with, um, with the price regulators, particularly in the UK. I mean, there's a, a very active dialogue, and hopefully we'll see some things coming out over the next few months, where, where the price regulators, the NICE in particular, uh, but it's not l limited to them, uh, are really saying, we need to get ourselves ready for this. We need to understand Absolutely. what it means when somebody brings to us a pricing mechanism that is something other than a straight discount. Right? Um, and they are doing a lot of work on that. And some of the things are quite actually very informative in terms of the, the because what, what matters to them almost as much as price, I mean, there are lots of different dimensions, is, is risk, actually. It's, it's the risk of spending your money on something that doesn't work when you could have spent it somewhere else. Right. And all of that can be built in. But at the, end, the one thing they always stress is it's not for us to negotiate the price or suggest the price mechanism. You know, reimbursement is, is, is not about price. It's about the whole mechanism. To what extent are you, Michael and, and Legere, thinking about those issues at the beginning of the development process? Because from my point of view, um, the normal health regulators have no intention of ever buying your product. There is another standard that you have to meet, which is the price regulator. Um, and are you building those into the design? Well, I shouldn't. <laughs> well, I shouldn't be thinking about this, but what I do know is that uh, people within organizations yeah. like Pfizer, GSK, <clears throat> are thinking a lot about it, a lot about this question. And you know, there are a lot of maps and heat maps and whatnot that that, that address exactly these type of questions. And I'm very confident. I think that there will be some viable um, uh, solu solution found for this. I mean, that's that's what these uh, companies are pretty good at. I think the difficulty is is that with gene therapies, you know, it's not a particular disease. It's it's a whole range of different diseases. So you could treat a hemophiliac, and yes, you can count the money you save um, over the years, uh, not having to give recombinant protein. Fair enough, that can be a template. But then there are other templates. If you if you, if you deal with deadly diseases where a child would die in its first year, all of a sudden you're creating potentially a patient for the next 20 or 40 years. By, by treating, successfully treating this child, or a potential patient, um, you know, might break a leg or, and, and so on. So you, you, these calculations are then all of a sudden not that simple. And I think probably part of the answer will be, uh, as it most likely is on a disease base already, um, you know, on a disease by disease base. <laughs> I think yeah. that uh, it's, uh, as you were saying, you know, a negotiation that will depend on the, on the specific diseases. and. Uh, as you were saying, uh, there are certain uh, gene therapy approaches that are life-saving. So what can you say, you know, whether you have uh, no choice or you know, choice of having a normal life and uh, not having a, a number of uh, uh, um, subsequent degenerations that uh, will have a cost uh, anyhow for the society, because also this is something that we have to take into consideration. We see all the families that, uh, you know, abandon the work to, uh, be able to follow the children, and that is uh, anyhow a cost for the society as well. There is a balance that needs to be made, and I think that maybe a payment for performance could make sense, not to stand it forever, but you know, and not for every therapy and not exactly, every drug. And not for everything. Um, 
there is a, a, a great uh, uh, consciousness and awareness, uh, at least for us, in developing uh, therapies, thinking also of the cost of the therapy we will bring to the market. So we try to create, for example, on ex vivo gene therapy, ways uh, through which you can select the cell population through which uh, the, uh, the vector will go for the expression. So you will have uh, a cost of good that will, uh, will be uh, substantially decreased because you can select and you can transduce the, a smaller amount of, of cells and theoretically uh, coming to a, a position in which uh, from large production you can actually go down to small production by having a subset of uh, cell population. I think that, uh, again, this is an all new world uh, that we need to explore and we need to adjust. And I think that uh, the good uh, uh, feeling is anyhow that there is a discussion um, and that uh, uh, it's not a problem of a single entity or a single stakeholder that is uh, uh, felt by the patients, is felt by uh, the developers, is felt by uh, pharmaceutical companies and uh, also by uh, the national health systems or insurance uh, that are involved in this. Just, uh, uh, do we have some microphones? <coughs> so I'm going to open up for questions. Uh, I'll do that now if anybody's got a question. Yep, we've got one up there at the back and then Chris down the front. Yes, working. Thank you. Uh, I'm going back to the cost density issue, just making a comparison. Uh, uh, we, we keep talking about this as it's uh, something too much new for the healthcare system of, as a one-time uh, payment, but I see some similarities. Uh, think about, for example, of a uh, heart or liver transplant. That's a one-time, super high-risk, super expensive treatment, okay? And then uh, uh, nobody's asking if uh, six months later the transplant is rejected, then the hospital gets a lower reimbursement. I don't think so. And so why? Uh, it looks like that the company has to come with the super innovative solutions to a problem that is already uh, somewhere else. So, uh, and I know I'm comparing a drug to a medical treatment, and I know it's not the same thing, but from the point of view of the payers, it's the same thing. It's about how efficiently the system is spending their money. So it's just a comment. No, I think it's a really interesting comment. I, 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 I know from my own experience that, that the tools that the uh, UK price regulators used to uh, analyze, they would analyze a heart transplant in a, in a very similar way. Um, the question then becomes the relationship between um, what they're actually willing to pay for because they're essentially paying themselves in that system. And, what, and that takes you down another alley in terms of sort of the ethics of the relationship between commerce and, uh, and the healthcare system, which we probably haven't got time for. But th does anybody else want to respond to that in any way in terms of? I fully agree. I mean, I, I would love people to, uh, the reimbursement authorities, to listen to this kind of, of, a, of a rationale. I think the, the problem is because of, of the historical uh, basis for, for judging you know, gene therapies, even though it's one-off, as a product and comparing it to the way products are traditionally reimbursed. And so that mindset to shift to uh, some kind of a process uh, is, is very difficult. I, I wonder maybe if I can uh, add something to this. <clears throat> you know, in, in the scenario of transplant, we have very strong statistical data um, about how many transplants do you do, how many complications do you have, how much do they cost. And I think it's <clears throat> pretty straightforward to calculate sort of uh, the cost of that at, at the end of the day. I think gene therapy uh, uh, it could be treated the same way at the point where we get to the data, to, to the information, the statistics around it. Well, we don't know how often this really will be successful. We hope, and in some, ev in some cases we have evidence that in a very large number of cases we can be su successful, but we just don't have the, the clinical data that would allow anybody with money to calculate how much this should cost. And that's why if we have a more iterative process, more adaptive reimbursement, adaptive pricing, then I think we can eventually have this data to confirm or not our initial assumptions. Yeah. I mean, there are some issues you just simply cannot deal with, even with the, with the, with the, with the pricing mechanisms. If, if the whole of the national budget is going to go on paying for the drugs, you can't deal with that. But, but uh, the message that I would get out of this in terms of putting across is, is it's in the hands of the manufacturers, the developers of these products, to think about the reimbursement 
early on and develop the data that supports it. And the more data you have that supports it, the better discussion you're going to have. And, and I would say not just in our hands, but it's very much our responsibility <coughs> to do so. Absolutely. Any more questions? Chris? Yeah, I, I wanted to pick up on the, on the same point, really, but, but from a slightly different angle. Um, one of the issues which seems to and certainly has impacted stock prices recently is this question of durability of response. And we talk about cure, transformative therapies. Um, so my question really to the panel is about do we need to either reset the barometer on when we talk about these therapies as once and done, uh, that maybe they are something that we treat every five years, which is still a great business model, or, and or maybe, is it a scientific problem? We've really got to get around this and turn these into a, a once and done. And is that possible with the technology that we have at present? So it's really about setting expectation and where are we in terms of the science of possibly making it a once and done? Well, <laughs> uh, let's say that uh, you know, the follow-up that we have on the clinical trials that are ongoing uh, cannot yet give a final answer to that. Uh, what, uh, what we can see, at least uh, from the trials that uh, Peloton is doing uh, for those specific rare diseases, is that uh, when it works, uh, it's uh, uh, with a follow-up of 14 years, so we have come up to specific diseases, so with such a long follow-up, it seems to be irreversible, so you are cured, even if I shouldn't use this word. <laughs> So I think that uh, this is something that can happen, but again, it needs to be uh, declined for, uh, declined for each different disease, and uh, depending on the uh, outcome that we are expecting by the specific therapeutic approach. Um, so it's, uh, it needs to be... I, I would say yes to both of those. I think that uh, currently the concept is once and done, and that is the ultimate goal, certainly. And I think that as we treat broader populations with one-shot gene therapy, and if uh, for some reason a couple of years from now uh, patients' uh, response rates are, are no longer what they were, then we're going to have a pool of patients which we can do clinical studies to see uh, what a second dose uh, may do to them. At the same time, we need to be working on better technologies, uh, better vectors, um, better ways to extend that response. And I think that is ultimately where we will go by going via the perhaps repeat dosing for some diseases for some uh, patient types. I think, yeah, I think it, I mean, it's almost taking the rational approach to say, well, why isn't it once and done currently? Or what are the constraints? What are the, what are the gates to either being once and done or the gates to it being multiple dosing over a period of time? And how do we design ourselves around that? So is it is it loss of, loss of cells that, that simply the gene is being lost or is the gene being silenced? We can, obviously, I think we can do something around the silencing aspect with our synthetic biology approach. Mm -hmm. Is it around multiple dosing in the, in the immune response? So then it comes down to the vectorology side or even saying, well, how do we come up with a synthetic um, delivery vehicle? So we heard from Max Seid earlier with the, the technology that, so how do we design viruses out of gene therapy? and, and I think we need to be looking in detail in, in that area and how we deliver synthetic vehicles in vivo to get around the, the immune response issue. And I think it, this is where um, the market forces, if you like, will drive innovation in the industry. And that might come out of more again back into the academic fold, or it might come out of some of the more innovative industries that are starting to develop around this, that, but that, I think it's exciting opportunities. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm, I'm going to use that as a sort of segue into a, a sort of last word from everybody in terms of, you know, there's a huge amount of investment going into this industry. We haven't heard any, I haven't heard anything about problems that can't be solved or problems that have actually, some, in some cases, gone away, like, in my view, the regulatory problem. The, but, you know, what's the future look like? 30 seconds each, or slightly less than 30 seconds each, 15 seconds each. Just what does the future look like? Why is it such a promising industry? Well, because uh, you know we start seeing the fruit, the fruits of the early and very you know hard work that has been put into the field. We know it can work. Now we have to make it work in an environment that allows to make a medicine out of a, out of an, an academic proof of concept. Um, like, it works. We know it works. We brought a drug to market. It's been done. Um, they have to get better. They have to move ahead. Uh, let's move on to volume two and volume three. But yes, it works. Richard? 
So it's a multidisciplinary approach in which there are contributions from different sites and uh, definitely even a combination of gene and cell therapy is, is going to be another paradigm that we follow. Well, I hope to spend the next 20 years in this field as well as the last 20, <laughs> so I'm pretty excited. Um, I, I think the clinical data is great. There's obviously no shortage of, uh, of targets to go after, but I think innovation around how we deliver and how we manufacture and how we get it as a, as a druggable therapeutic product, there's still challenges there, and that makes it interesting. Well, thank you very much. I mean, we've heard, you know, from just summarizing from my perspective, you know, it, it's a different industry. It's not the one that... Uh, it's in a more advanced and more sophisticated industry than the one we saw a few years back. That, that you could talk about chill wind. For me, the whole thing just stopped. Um, and uh, we've heard that you know there's a positive relationship with the regulators. We've heard that there are capacity problems, but they are being dealt with in different ways. Um, we've heard that one company's got across the line in terms of being paid, and people are starting to think about that early in their development process. And, uh, and the future is bright. So uh, with that, um, we'll look forward to another 20 years, hopefully. Of reaping the rewards rather than just planting the seeds. But thank you very much to the panel. Thank you.